Hi, I'm George Cow, and I'm happy to be here with one of my clients, Michelle Olson. She is a career purpose coach. Um, she works with her clients on, of course, not just the career issues, but all this, also the inner uh, issues that are preventing them from having a thriving career. Uh, anyway, I'm excited to bring you on to this interview. Michelle, hi. Hi, George. Always happy to be with you. Yeah. So let me read your bio um, so folks can have a, some context for, for what you do, and then we'll go into um, some of the lessons you've learned as you've grown your coaching business, and you'll also share with us uh, some insight on the inner critic, which is something that uh, you work with some of your clients on. You, you create some content around that. That is an issue that people have as they do career transition, career development, et cetera. So uh, let me start with your bio. So Michelle is the founder and coach at Greenlight Coaching. She is focused on helping women birth their career purpose. She helps heart-centered, busy women find clarity and purpose and assists uh, them in taking action during their career transitions. She is a fierce advocate for more purpose-driven work in this world. Michelle had a 12-year corporate career in sales uh, before making her own soul-satisfying career change about 10 years ago. Her website is greenlight-coaching.com. I'll be sure to put the link in the notes of the video. So um, let's see, you know, one of the things that you have been learning about, especially transitioning from your corporate career a decade ago is how to bring more of yourself into your work. Um, so kind of maybe I'll just let you share whatever you like there in terms of how that's impacted your business, how that, you know, why it's, that's an important thing for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I had this 12 year um, corporate work and um, anyone watching or listening knows that there's not a huge invitation in the corporate world to bring your whole self. I mean, they definitely want you to bring yourself to work and they want engagement and they want um, production. But the idea of bringing your whole self to work wasn't something that I personally experienced in my time in that environment. And so when I made the transition to creating, well, first moving into my own business, creating my own work, um, I realized there was some, you know, it was a little wobbly at first because I thought I had to present myself in this very specific professional way and it had to look a certain way. And, and what I realized is when I tried to do it that way, it would, lo it would really land flat with people. And I could feel it. It didn't feel good to me either, like trying to um, act professional. <laughs> and so as you know, as the time has gone by, as the years has gone by, have gone by, what I realize is the more and more I just bring all of myself, like the spiritual part of myself, the heart part of myself, the compassionate part of myself, the logical part of myself to both my clients and my business, it just goes better. I attract people that are well aligned for me and the work I do in the world. And I find that my I feel better in my business that there's a contentment that I experience in because I'm not trying to be anybody else but myself. Um, so that was that's been a big lesson um, for me in work and business. Um, and then I'd add one more thing. I is is I think experimenting over and over is a big lesson that I've gotten from you, George. Is just like try something out, hear the feedback, <laughs> adjust if needed. So like giving myself permission to just keep trying things out and seeing if they land or not. So that would be the second is just experimentation. And one of the experimentations you've done with your content is, well, I mean, just in terms of topics, right? Like you notice that, oh, when you talk about the inner critic, yeah that seems to be something your audience particularly likes seeing from you. Yes. Um, tell, I mean, talk about that process. I mean, in terms yeah. of testing the content topics and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So since, you know, I really started being consistent with content while working with you over the past year and a half and, um, 
I love that you give us all permission, like we all need a permission slip, but you do that well to, you know, to test our content. And one of the things is I have all these, you know, I have these quote unquote hard skills. Like I can teach people how to do an informational interview and I can teach people how to network and I can teach people the Enneagram and I can teach people Myers-Briggs and all of that is valuable. But what I find that the people who really end up working with me um, in a, in a coaching relationship is they really want to delve into more of how do I work with fear? How do I work with doubt? How do I work with um, communication? You know, how do I work with my higher self listening to my wisdom? And so more in this, you know, internal spiritual world to, to go towards new work versus some of the standard things you'll see in like career counseling where it's um, it's more focused on what does your resume look like or you know um, how do you how do you show up for an interview and present your best self so that doesn't technically land with the, my people <laughs> so yeah that was that was good to notice talk about that I'd, I'd love for you to so yeah people think career coach they think okay great you're gonna yeah. you're gonna get me a great resume so right. that when I send it to anybody, they're going to be like wowed by it and they're going to put me on the top of the pile and then I'm going to have to have to be a great interviewer and then I'll get in. Yeah. So why is that not, you know, why is that not necessarily the best way of going about a career transition? Because in my experience, it's focused on the outside, right? So again, kind of going back to my own like parallel process, like, if, if it's coming from the outside and not from within, then it's not integrated. And when it's not integrated, then we're not landing in fulfillment or satisfaction. We're just, we're kind of robots marching to the next right thing based on expectations externally versus what is it internally that you're being called to? What is it internally that lands for you? Um, work has always fascinated me, just the idea of work you know, business, nonprofit, entrepreneurship. I just think it's a really fascinating, in, in the world that we live in, we work a lot, <laughs> you know, like. Most of, our, most of our waking hours, which is so, why it's so important to think about, yeah. So important, and it's so many of our waking hours. And so, you know, we put attention on our personal relationships. We put attention for us mothers on our children. We put attention on our fam family relationships. So why not create a relationship with work and, and that meets you in a way that feels satisfactory. Um, and so, I mean, not to say that, not, that resume and networking is not important. That information is good to have. But I find if you start there, it's not actually getting to the change that someone's seeking when they're wanting to create more purpose work in their life. They're wanting to create more satisfaction and fulfillment and contentment and peace in their life. So, yeah, that's really great. So, um, well, you know, I'd love to touch on that idea of inner critic. I mean, since this is something you talk about with your clients and within your content. So, um, yeah, kind of walk us through what that means and why is that, how is that related to career transition, career development? Yeah. So, you know, any change we go through as humans, we are, we feel fear. It's a natural, it's a totally natural response, especially when we're going out of our comfort zone or the familiar, we're going to feel fear. So that, so I think first and foremost, I just invite clients to just be like, yeah, I'm going to feel some fear <laughs> and that's okay. Um, and then secondly, you know, starting to really understand when does the fear pop up? So for that individual to get clear of like, oh, when I, when I try to network, my fear really comes up or when I try um, to even think, I'll take it even a further step back, even think about changing my work life, I get really scared. And so, you know, really meeting the fear with compassion and kindness and acceptance is the very first step. And then getting a clear understanding of when it pops up and when it happens in your life, like when you notice, oh, right, that's my fear zone, you know. 
Um, and then really uh, learning to go, what is it like to say to you? What is the common messages? Where did those messages originate? Are those messages from your parents? Are they messages from your teachers, your grandparents, religious institutions, school institutions? Like starting to get very clear on where, who's actually saying this? Because <laughs> usually if you dig, you'll find that it came from someone else as a young person. And so that helps create a little bit of space between yourself and the fear. And then, um, and then I always like using the common thing um, of naming your inner critic. So giving your inner critic a name. You know, some people have called their inner critic the demon or Voldemort from Harry Potter or um, Miss Bevy, you know, the white collar guy, someone <laughs> named their inner critic. So again, it's just creating more space between the thinking of the inner critic and yourself. And um, I don't think fear necessarily goes away, but I think fear quiets when you take the action. So, you know, really committing to what is it that I want to do? I feel scared. Okay, acknowledge that. Give it really good love and attention. And then go, okay, I'm going to do it anyway, even if I'm scared. And so moving, taking that action, regardless of if the fear is there or not. That's great. Do you have, can you, is there a, a situation in a client's life or transition that you can think of where um, the inner critic was, was there or how did they manage that to be able to move forward is, or maybe in your own life? Yeah. And is there a, yeah, I just thought of one client when you saw, so a client emailed me last week and she said, um, Michelle, I'm so excited i finally broke through so she was a she's a software engineer by trade and she was working for a big organization in the bay area and decided to leave that organization she's a mom she wanted to find something that was going to give her more flexibility and um she's very shy very 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 shy woman and very um introverted and so she it was really hard for her to reach out and, and network and meet people. And yet <clears throat> the need was greater than the fear, right? Like she needed to do it if she was going to make this change that she deeply desired. And so she recently just emailed me to say that she found um, a group of other women, other software engineers, and now she's working with this group and, and feels like, all the work she did, like all the time it took to work through that fear has paid off and she is super satisfied. It was exactly what she had envisioned in our work together. And um, yeah, and so it was, you know, I think what was great is I never encouraged her to step farther than would be, you know, um, what do I want to say? I think there's this, like, if you think of a circle, right? Like, I think if you're this far out, it can be too scary, but if you can just go this far out when working with fear, then you start pressing that, you know, your edge starts getting a little further. And I really witnessed that with her. So, um, yeah, I'm thrilled for her. I'm thrilled she. That's, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Um, I also love for you to talk for just a minute or two. I know it's not a lot of time, but, but just to give us a sense of, I mean, you, you have so many different skill sets, but one of them is the personality um typing with enneagram with myers-briggs um i know probably some of you watching this are familiar with one or both of them but maybe you can share what you like about each one uh, and what it is for those who don't know or need a refresher sure um so i'll start with myers-briggs because i think it's a simpler system than the enneagram and with Myers-Briggs, it's definitely behavior-based. So it looks at specific behaviors and there's 16 different dichotomies. And so the first one is either introversion or extroversion, an I or an E. And that is based on our energy, you know, whether we um, build our energy through solitude and time alone, or we build our energy through being with a group and observing 
outside ourselves. So the extroversion, introversion. The next one is N and S, which is intuition and sensing, um, which I will say that none of these make sense. <laughs> they were created in the 1940s. But anyway, so intuition is basically you get a general sense or general idea of something. You would look at an art painting and you'd probably use words like, oh, that, you know, that brings me joy or that painting opens my heart would be an intuitive response. A sensing would, response would be like, they use the colors of red and blue and yellow. And look, they use this, this curve right here. And then they use the square right here. So it'd be two people looking at the exact same paintings, but interpreting the information differently. So that's intu intuition and sensing. Um, the third one is, feeling or thinking and this is the decision making part of it and so if you're a feeler feeler you're making your decision based on how you feel and if you're a thinker you're typically making your decision based on logic um, and then the last is judging or perceiving and this is basically how we do life and so um, going back to the corporate environment it's a very judging culture in, and I, it doesn't mean that term judging in the way I'm using it. It's, it means that if you tell someone who's a J, judging J, that they need to have a project done by noon the next day, more than likely they're going to have it done by 10 a.m. <laughs> because judges just get things done. And that's why the corporate environment tends to hold that culture because they want production. They want people moving. With P's, P's need a deadline. They definitely need a deadline. So if you say, I need it tomorrow at noon, they're typically going to finish it at like 11, 59, and 30 seconds. <laughs> so they, they'll meet it. I mean, they actually meet the deadline, but they, they perceivers like to be in the process piece more. So that's just a general overview of the Myers-Briggs. The Enneagram, which... Um, I once heard and like repeating is is the is Myers-Briggs on steroids is all based on our motivation so what motivates us it's a very old system it's was created um, it's created from lots of different uh, religious backgrounds Sufism Christianity Judaism um, and it's considered a spiritual system so we're born into our type and there's nine types on the Enneagram, just as a simple basis. And each type has a fear and a motivation to it. And so what's beautiful, I, I really love the Enneagram, what's beautiful about the system is people often hear personality assessments and they go, no, I don't want to be put in a box. I don't want to be judged or, you know, maybe that those feelings might come up. But in reality, what it's doing is it's opening your perspective, you know, like if we only have one ninth of the perspective of the full system, if we learn the other types and really understand their motivation and fear, all of a sudden we put on these glasses and we get a bigger view of ourselves. We get a bigger view of the people we're working with, our family members, our friends, um, so it's a really beautiful system and it's and there's a lot of detail to it that I won't go into today but just as an introduction it's it is a system that's based on motivation and if someone's interested in personal growth it's an excellent system to use to just you know start looking at places where you might have blind spots and or not feel good and you want to expand in that area I think it's a gentle system in that way Wow that's great to hear you summarize that from your perspective because you've been working with these things uh, so deeply for a while and with so many people and you've taught classes on it and and so it's really cool so is that something that you enjoy working with clients on if they're interested yeah, in that definitely that's cool definitely. And, then you, and then they could of course with that perspective um, do more thoughtfully their relationships at work and with different people, they'll start noticing the different personality types and different motivations yes. and be able to kind of navigate yes. that better. Right? Yes. Yes, I've had the opportunity to lead some teams in this and what they 
the feedback I get from them afterwards is um, it helps them understand their coworkers so much better. And they're like, oh, that's why she does that thing. <laughs> so there's this immediate like empathy and compassion and understanding. Um, it also can help with communication. You know, each type communicates differently. And so understanding, oh, that person is a seven. They really like direct communication. Or, oh, that person is a nine. They hate conflict. They avoid it at all costs. So, you know, if I'm going to give them critical feedback, it needs to be gentle and kind. And, you know, I mean, that's probably a good rule for any type. But, you know, just as a general understanding, knowing what the person's individual type is and how to meet them mm. can be super valuable in your work life. Fantastic. So let's wrap up. And I'd love for you to share uh, what your your gift for the audience is uh, yeah. you have a very generous um, offer. So I'll let you. Yeah. It. So through, through coaching with George, um, you've taught me to again, listen to my clients and what do I, you know, what feedback do they give me? And um, I typically work with people for a longer term because it takes time to make a transition and it takes time first to figure out what you want to do and then actually find the work. And, um, but every so often I get people who come to me and they say, oh, could you just do a one-off session with me? I really, and I kept hearing it over and over. And so I recently created a, a um, typically my coaching sessions are 45 minutes. So I created a 60 minute consultation session and I figured it's a great opportunity for people who have a specific thing they're working on. I mean, maybe even the Enneagram. They want to know their Enneagram type and they want to dive into it a little bit deeper. That'd be a great way to use the session. Um, I had a woman, I did one with a woman last week and she wants to hire a VA. And so we came up with a plan on how she could where to look for the VA first and foremost, how to do the interviews and set them up, how to do the reference calls. Um, so we came up with this great plan and she was super satisfied after. Um, I had another person do a session and it was actually a man, I typically work with women, but he wanted a one-off session on building more opportunities. He was in a job search. And so we went through and created a plan to keep him in momentum so he could, you know, build um reaching out to people and doing a job search so the session can be used in a, a, several different ways um motherhood <laughs> you know if you're if you're in mother deep in the throes of motherhood this is a great topic i like to work with and you you're really wanting to find some flexibility with work we could brainstorm ideas on that so it's a it's more of a consulting um 60 minutes with me than coaching. I will offer coaching in it. I, it's as needed, but it's, it is more of like bringing our two minds together and then pulling out of me resources I might have to support an individual in their um, work life or communication or several different topics. That's great. I love it. I love it. So it's a single session. Uh, they get a lot out of that um, because of your experience in these different areas. And if they want to, they can also sign up with to work with you in a more structured way over a longer period of time for deeper transformations for a more holistic view on on their career and their and their life so yeah awesome um, great well thanks Michelle so yeah. always good to talk with you you too and uh, is there a final encouragement you want to give to those uh, let's just say those who are um, in a career transition what would you say I would what say would there's say? hope there's hope. I think a lot of people get discouraged, especially if they're middle age. They think, oh, well, I'm, you know, the 20 years in, why, you know, why bother? I'll wait till retirement. I would say there's hope. You can do it. <laughs> it's possible. You know, it takes time. I, I'll be realistic. It does, it does take time. It's not something you'll do overnight, but it, it is possible. You can transition into something that you would more soothe your heart and be fulfilling for you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll be sure, of course, the links are below. So please go, go ahead and follow up with Michelle. And uh, she also has lots of content on her, on her Facebook page, on her blog. So be sure to check that out. She has a great newsletter. Um, so 
thanks, Michelle, for all the work that you do. Thanks, George. Thank you. Be well. okay. Bye.